This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Three games for the Flames, another three-game week, and we are back just before the bye week. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, you and I predicted a sweep this week, and we came close, but not quite. Uh, overall thoughts on this week for the Flames? Well, the Flames are learning how to be an elite team, and elite teams, when they're playing mediocre opponents, have to take them out behind the woodshed and thump them out, and... They've done that last week with Arizona, and they did that with Detroit and Edmonton. And frankly, even Buffalo, that was a game that they should have won if not for some iffy goaltending in the third period in overtime. But, you know, on the whole, they're doing well. Uh, I think they're 10-1-2 and two in their last, or 11-1-2 and two in their last 14. So, you know, there's not really much you can complain about. Well, why don't we uh, talk about that Buffalo game? Let's start there. Last week, Calgary played Buffalo on Wednesday in the Saddle Dome, a team that we don't normally see very often, and not a lot of people get up for Buffalo. But uh, Calgary got the early lead. Johnny Goudreau got his 28th goal of the year. Then Buffalo entered back in the second when Evan Rodriguez, a baseball name if I've ever heard one, scored his fourth of the year. And then Kachuk responded back. We had a Dolan and McCabe goal to put... Buffalo ahead, and Noah Hannafin scored late in the third to tie the game, and unfortunately Jack Eichel puts it in overtime. Flames get one point out of this game. Yeah, and like the one defensive breakdown that they had in the second period ended up in their net, and then from the second period on, they only surrendered three shots, and Buffalo scored three times. So, you know, it's one of those games where If you play that game a hundred times, that was probably the only time Buffalo wins that one. It's just that, unfortunately, bad things happened, and we only got one point. But at least we got a point. See, to me, this was the I told you so game. The coach had been telling this team for a while that, you know what, you guys can't keep playing this way defensively, bad things are going to happen. And as much as he said that, the Flames kept winning somehow. And after this game, I looked around, and I kind of said to myself... We told you so. Like This, to me, was some of the Flames' bad defensive habits we've seen over the last week, week and a half, coming back to bite them. Yeah, well, like we look back to the Arizona game last week, and like the coaching staff had chewed them out a bit to get their stuff together, and then they went out and they demolished the Coyotes 7-1. to And then in the Buffalo game, their details were a little off again, and... It, they didn't do a bad job, mind you. It's just that every chance that Buffalo had, it seemed, went in the net. And there's not much you can do about that. Sometimes you have games like that. Rick didn't have a very good start. And that happens. But uh, the Flames needed to respond well from that. And they did get a point, at least. So it's not the end of the world. It's just that they have to be more consistent in their thought process on the ice. Yeah, the way I looked at it is, you know, one point against an Eastern Conference team when we're already number one, that, you, you know, you can't win them all. And at least we got a point. No. Exactly. And, like, if you're losing, but you're getting a point out of it, it's like, okay, sure. The next team, we've beat them now both times we played them this year. On Friday night, the Detroit Red Wings came to town, and this one took really the battle of the special teams for the Flames to win here. They got three goals in the power play, one on the shorthand to win a 6-4 victory over the Red Wings. And for the Flames, we had Bennett, Monaghan, Neal, which is a name we haven't heard a lot this year, Giordano and uh, Bennett again, and Brody score. So first, let's talk about uh, James Neal, his fifth goal of the year. You think the floodgates are going to open, Matt? Yeah, he's starting to play. You know, like We even saw that at, towards the end of last month where he started shooting the puck more, being more involved in the play. 
And, like, he'd just miss the net or he'd hit the post or the goalie would make a good save. And now we're starting to see some of those pucks go in. And after the Detroit game in the four games, including that one prior to uh, the Detroit game, he had four points. So it's... You obviously want more from James Neal, but as long as he's starting to figure things out, like, even if he can be, from, like, now to the end of the season, be on, like, a 40-point over 82 game pace or half a point per game so if he gets 16 points from here to the end i think that that would be fine and like we haven't really needed him to perform much to start the year but as long as he starts contributing a little bit here and there the rest of the way, that's the important And we have to remember, he's currently playing on the third line, which when you look at what his contributions were maybe in past teams or past lineups where he was the number one winger, you're going to get a different level of performance when he's getting limited ice time. Yeah, and like if not for the freakish chemistry between Lindholm, Monaghan, and Goudreau, James Neal probably would have been on that line for a good portion of this season. It's just that it that chemistry seems to work and work very well, so you can't really complain that much about him having less of a role. Well, that chemistry works, the 3M line works, like I think he's just he's the victim of chemistry yeah. all up the lineup. And that that's not a bad thing to have. Now you just have to go find somebody to have chemistry with him and have three scoring lines and then win games 10 to 1 instead of 7 to 1. <laughs> There you go. You got it all planned out. (laughs) I actually thought Mike Smith had a really good game despite giving up four goals. Yeah, no, I I agree. He looked more solid. Yeah, like none of the four goals he could have done anything with. One was a deflection. One was a tire fire defensive breakdown, the fourth goal. And the other two, one was a screen, and the other one, you have Anthony Mantha from the point, or from the face-off circle, like... you're not going to stop many of those. So I have nothing to complain about with him, and hopefully he continues to play well. To me, he's still looking like the backup guy. I don't think he's earned his starter oh, job yeah, back, for sure. but he's, I'm more confident when he's in net. I mean, there was a point where you put him in net, and it was like, all right, we've lost, so we can turn the TV off now at the uh-huh. you know at the anthem, and at least he's holding yeah, his own. Yeah, it's now. sort of like uh, all of the goalies when Kipper was in net, the – when Kipper wasn't playing, it's like, and we we're losing. So Saturday night, Calgary made a quick trip up to Edmonton to play our provincial rivals in the Battle of Alberta, the second last one of the year. And as we all expected, Calgary trounced on Edmonton. Big 5-2 win for the Flames, getting goals from Giordano, uh, Goudreau, Shillington, Backland, and Monaghan. Um, Matt, anything you can say about this game besides, yeah, baby! Uh, well, frankly, the Edmonton Oilers are a completely horrible hockey team, and if not for Koskinen playing extremely well, I think this could have easily been an 8 or 9 goal performance for the Flames, and yeah, it, he was bad. The The whole team's bad, Like, and I think that teams are seeing what the Flames did to McDavid, it, by hitting them, and it that completely neutralized them. I think that you're going to see everybody just saying, "Hey, let's hit McDavid now." And but we can't be the first guys to invent that strategy. No, but I think that like other teams had respect for him and giving him time and space, and that allowed him to do things. And the Flames were just pretty much mucking it up with him whenever possible and not worrying about any of the other players on the team actually standing up for him. And they didn't. And the Oilers are, frankly, a pathetic franchise. And, like, them signing Koskinen to a three-year deal at $4.5 million is just stupid. Well, Um, I think it's funny that they, what, they just got Spooner and he's on waivers again today? Well, you look at Jordan Eberle... They traded him last year for Strom. Then this year they trade Strom for Spooner, and now they're waving Spooner. Like so, they literally just gave Eberly away. Like that is a horrible, horrible asset management. And like they could have got a first round pick for Eberly at the minimum if they actually decided to trade him for something. But 
you know, it's Edmonton, and yeah, just dumb. Like there's the, like honestly, it's to the point now where it's like, is the general manager actively trying to sabotage the team? Because all of their moves this season have, frankly, like other than signing Koskinen, all of them have been. Like, if the Flames fans were trying to sabotage the Oilers, that would be the kinds of things that would be done. <laughs> well, and even Koskinen was brought in to be a backup, and I think he's just outperformed whatever and expect him to do. Yeah. True enough. But let's move on from that. We'll take the win. We'll take the big win over the provincial rivals. And uh, that was it for the week. Oh, yeah. Um, we thought I'd let everyone know we talked last week a little bit about the re-signing of Kachuk and Riddick and what those contracts might look like. It looks like the Flames may have opened negotiations there. Both players have the same agent, it looks like, Craig Oster, and he was in town for the Buffalo game. So you've got to imagine he didn't just come to watch some hockey. He's probably here to start negotiations for his clients. Yeah, and the Flames are going to re-sign both of those players, and Riddick will probably be in the two and a half to three million dollar range, and Kachuk will probably be in the seven-ish million dollar range, and it'll get done. Like I'm not overly concerned. It's it is what it is, and it's gonna be a process. And I wouldn't expect either guy really to get signed until probably July or August. Maybe even towards the beginning of training camp in Kachuk's case, but it'll get done. And and we've seen that the Flames aren't afraid to you know delay contract negotiations like that. I mean, they did it with Johnny. We've seen them do it a few times. So if if they can't get the deal they want, I think they're perfectly willing to wait till training camp to get Kachuk signed. Yeah, well, it makes sense. Like you're not gonna just go with things just because. Oh well. You know, we want to have you before training camp. Like, you have to make sure that the dollars work. And the Flames wouldn't be where they are if they were just like the Oilers where, oh, well, you're good, so here's a truckload of money and not actually planning the team out or anything like that. Yeah, and they'll find a way to get both these guys done. Yeah. We can talk about them later in the year, but I think the other question there salary-wise is Sam Bennett. And honestly, with him, I, I'm seeing around two, two and a half. Like, I, I don't see him getting, like, three or four or anything like that. He uh, just hasn't delivered enough offense to warrant that kind of a contract. Yeah, he's making just under two now. I think 2.5 would be a generous increase for him. Yeah. Uh, well, Matt, next question I wanted to ask you. we got 32 games left. Right now, the Calgary Flames have played 50 games. Um, they are sitting seven points back from the league lead from Tampa Bay. So in these last 30 ga- 32 games, how do you see the Flames dividing up the workload and net? We've seen, you know, my, we've seen Riddick take on a lot of games. We've seen Smitty come back lately. But I think at this point, they've got to start thinking about conserving Riddick because we don't know how much gas is in the tank for the playoffs. And we'd hate this to become another Brian Elliott. Yeah, and frankly, I would expect the Flames to start... Like, I think that they need to find another goaltender, and it doesn't even need to be a good one, just like an average backup. I think that would be an improvement on Smith. And I, Al Montoya? I sure. You know, like, just somebody you can throw... Because, frankly, like, I don't think Riddick himself is that awesome of a goaltender, where, like... The Flames are a very good team, and he'll make any goaltender, they'll make any goaltender look decent just because of that. And like I think that Riddick is basically a league average goaltender, a, a poor starter to average backup or high end backup, and yet his stats are showing a lot better. Obviously, but that's I think due in large part to the fact that the team is good. Well, and, that's the nice thing about being a good team is you don't need a great goalie. No, and that's why, I, like, I would want the Flames to get another goaltender just because of that. But they need to, like, they don't need to go get Bobrovsky or anything ridiculous like that. They just need an adequate goaltender, and that will be an upgrade on Smith. And like, frankly, like if it can't, like, say Riddick got hurt at the end of the season. 
I'd actually rather start Parsons in the playoffs than Smith at this point. So, you know, and that's for how I'd break them down. I'd probably go 2012, uh, Riddick getting 20 games, Smith getting 12. The Flames do have a lot of games against, frankly, mediocre opponents. Like 11 of the 32 are against teams that are more in our bracket of talent. And the rest are against, like, that middle group, like Edmonton, and then and the completely horrible teams. So I, I would expect that you'll see them getting a lot more games against Smith getting, or the new backup getting more games against the inferior teams with Riddick playing whenever the Flames are playing an elite team. I think if I'm going to split those games up, I think it'll probably end up looking similar to your numbers. Um, I think going into February, if I were the Flames, I would start Mike Smith and play him until he doesn't look good and then put Riddick in for a couple and then do the same with Smitty again. I think you've got to get Smitty going, and the only way to do that is to play him. Yeah, and I think that like there's another full month before the trade deadline. And I think that you have to put Smith in for five of those games between now and then. And you have to see what he's doing. And if, frankly, if he has one bad game where he gives up a really bad goal like he has been, that's enough. Period. And end of story. And, like, he didn't in his last start, and he's been fairly decent more recently. But you can't, like, if he has another bad game or gives up a really horrible goal that he should stop then you do have to go with somebody else. And, yeah, it, it is what it is. Yeah, I think you've almost got to tell both guys to be ready every night because I can totally see, like you're saying, um, you know, put one guy in and if he probably Smitty. And if he doesn't do well, then Riddick's got to go in to mop up. So both guys have to be ready to play every night. Yeah. And we'll see. We have 11 games, 12 games total between now and the deadline. Yeah. And, like, I'd see, like, I know that next month the Flames play. Um, so, yeah, I think I'd probably go yeah. six and four. Well, like, uh, Smith play, or the Flames play six games against elite teams, and I would expect Riddick to get all six of those. And the other games are against kind of mediocre-ish teams. So... I would expect to see Smith getting a couple of those in there. Yeah, and that's fair. And then I think you make your March strategy based on, like you said, yeah, either trade exactly. or how they're looking in February. But it is, I mean, it is a concern. We saw a year when Elliot was looking really good and all of a sudden Elliot kind of, you know, crapped out in the playoffs. Yeah. So we'd hate to get Riddick well, like, in that's that why, position. Uh, like Tyler Parsons has started to look really good the last handful of games in Stockton. So he's starting to come along and like if in worst case scenario, if, you know, in case of emergency break glass, you have a guy who's not doing too badly in Stockton. Not ideal, mind you, but, you know. Well, I mean, you're the same guy who said, let's go out and acquire a uh, defenseman because you're not comfortable with the vet with the rookies on defense and you want a veteran there. So I'm not sure a rookie goalie is the way to go. I think I'd be more likely to put Gillies in in the playoffs just because he yeah, has some idea of the too. NHL game. I'd kind of just like see like which of them is playing better at the time, frankly, and go that route. Go with the hot hand, like because like if Gillies is struggling down the stretch yeah. and Parsons is hot, go with Parsons. If it's the other way around, go with Gillies. Like it, it, I'm not really biased one way or the other. It's like who's playing well. Hey, you're the guy. Well, and I think, you know, with Stockton not looking like they'll be in the playoffs, both guys will be here in Calgary. So, True. you know, we we have those options. Yeah. But, yeah, we'll see what happens, I think. And, by the way, I think that uh, I'm starting to feel more and more comfortable with Oliver Shillington and Yusuf Valimaki, like, when he's back to being 100% as the third left D like, I, I, for me, like, now I'm kind of more leaning, like, a, getting 
the equivalent of the backup level that we were talking about where just a guy that's okay and i think that like if you could just find like a guy who's better than prout but not as good as stone and like you know and it caused like a fifth round pick or something like that awesome what turns you around on the like, defense I, I don't what turns hmm? your opinion around uh, Shillington's play, actually, of late. Uh, he's doing a lot more than he was, and he's looking like he's more comfortable defensively. Like, uh, he hasn't really had any tire fire <laughs> type plays like he did earlier when he first came up. So, frankly, like, I'm not overly comfortable with it, but. I'm more comfortable. Like, it's not a absolutely we need a third pairing defenseman. It's more of a if you can get one for the right price, that's awesome. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with that. I think, you know, if we can get a defenseman, bring him in. Um, I still think Valimaki, he's back on the ice full time. He's going to be, um, he's going to be back soon, but I think they'll probably send him to Stockton over the bye week and that'll get some rust off of him. Yeah. And you see how he's playing. Like honestly, I wouldn't be opposed to having him down there for like most of February, even just playing like first pairing minutes, just to get back in the swing of things before being recalled if he is recalled. Because Shillington hasn't looked bad. Like it's one of those things where it's not like oh neither is pro no, and you're kind of like well the guy here is doing all right do you absolutely need to switch the guy out just because he's returned from injury like it, it it's not like shillington's been bad and we're winning in 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 spite of him it's he's contributing well to the team and that's kind of an unexpected bonus frankly have you heard anything more on Michael Stone and when he's come back? I know he's supposed to meet with a doctor last week, but I haven't heard anything. Uh, usually, from hearing other people ha- going through the same thing, like I'm assuming that he's off his blood thinners by now, which usually that takes two to three weeks just for it to completely get out of his system. So if that's the case, probably like after the bye week, maybe a week after that, you'd yeah, expect I'm- him to be back. That's kind of what I was thinking, too. There's no rush to bring him in for one more game this month. Give him the days off and bring him back that first road trip after the bye week. Yeah, and even then, you don't, with how Anderson and Chillington are playing, you don't necessarily need to rush him in anyway. Yeah, and I could see him being essentially a healthy scratch, but being back to that point where he can be playing. And you can ass- assign him to Stockton for a conditioning stint, so... Yeah, that's also a feasibility. Yeah, and I think a lot of that's going to depend. I don't think they'll send him down if they're back in play, but if he's ready to go now, I could see him going down over the break. Yeah. But we'll see what happens there. I agree. Um, Every week we ask our fans to send us questions via social media every Monday before we record, and this week we got a question from Jonathan Nimmo on Twitter. He's at JDNimmo12, who asked us, where do you... Where do you guys think the Lindholm Hannafin trade ranks in terms of greatest Flames trades ever? Has really pushed us to the next level this year. So I'll start with my answer on this. We're what, 50 games in the year? I don't think we can evaluate this as the best Flames trade of all time. For all we know, knock on wood, next game Lindholm could get hurt and, you know, could never play in the league again. So it's looking really promising now. Um, but I, I don't think we can evaluate this as one of the best trades of all time until at least two or three years into the trade. We also really need to see where Hannafin pans out to be here because he's still a second pairing guy and we gave up a first pairing guy for him. So we'll see what happens there, but it definitely is looking promising in terms of greatest flames trades ever. I can think of some that maybe for the guy they brought in, like the Kipper trade had more impact on the organization. Matt, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that for early returns that, this trade is one of the top tier trades in Flames history to this point. Whether that continues on, who knows? Like things could go haywire, but I don't really see. Like, 
Lindholm being the 35-ish point guy that he was prior to, I think that he is going to be a 60-ish or more point guy moving forward. And frankly, uh, Hannafin, if Calgary wasn't as deep on defense as we are, and like he's not playing behind a Norris Trophy favorite at this point, then I think that Hannafin could be on a first pairing in the NHL. It's just that, you know, when you have the guy who's probably at this point going to win the Norris Trophy on the blue line, you're kind of like, yeah, you can play on the second pair. Well, you and I talked about this when they (laughs) made the trade. I think the Hannafin move is a future move. They deliberately did it to get a guy to be there as Geo ages, and maybe as Geo retires, by then Hannafin will probably be peaking. So this is definitely an investment in the future. Oh, for sure. And, like, if you look at trajectories of defensemen of his caliber and style, he's 21, and he's already this good. Like, he's a top-end, second-pairing defenseman in the league. And he's 21. Defensemen usually don't get to be that good until they're 24, 25. If he continues on that progression, he could be one of the elite defensemen in the NHL when Giordano is getting ready to retire. So it's a good problem to have, frankly, and it's all good. Like I'm not really concerned. Like and I think Hamilton was overrated by a lot of players or people in terms of how he played. In terms of advanced stats, Hamilton was always really good, but just how he played, I was never really overly a fan. And, like, for me, like, defensemen should be able to play defense first, and that was never really the case with Hannah, Hamilton. It's right in the name of the position. Yeah. And I always got more of the feeling of Jay Bomeister from Hamilton, where he's just kind of... He has all the tools to be, like, a really dynamite player, but just there's something there that's holding him back and we've seen in Carolina that he's not being used anywhere near to the extent that the Flames did and Hannafin is a very good defenseman he had one stretch a couple like five six games ago where he was kind of bad but other than that he's been top notch all season so at least on that front, and it also helps that Hannafin's outscoring Hamilton, so... I think to really evaluate this trade, we have to see how Adam Fox progresses. Well, at this rate, like, Adam Fox would have to be a clear-cut, like, all-star defenseman just to make this trade even close. And the odds of that happening... I don't deny that Calgary definitely got the better end of this deal, but I'm not ready after 50 games to call it the best or one of the best trades in Flames history. Well, the Flames really haven't had that many dynamite trades in our history. Like, the Gilmore trade uh, to get Gilmore was a pretty good one. Uh, I guess it depends how, I mean, what we're looking at for best trade. Maybe there's something to discuss next week a little bit more. But, you know, I think the Lanny, you know, the move to bring Lanny McDonald in is underrated. That was a big move for this organization. True. You know, like, I, I think if nothing else... Land- Even the new and Dyke and Flurry trades, like, the writing was on the wall, and we ended up getting two franchise players in the Ginla and Regeer in those trades. So, like, that, like there have been decent moves. It's just that, frankly, the Flames tend not to be on the winning side of trades. Like, pretty much, like, the Kipper trade was, like, the only clear-cut like runaway winner and even the sharks got a good player with that draft pick so in vlasic so it's one of those odd things where calgary hasn't really had any real home run looking trades until this one and it is 50 games call me next year and see (laughs) but you know it, like if at this point next year the Flames two are doing as good as they have been and you know say Furlan's on another team and Han- Hamilton's just doing okay then you know you're looking at one of the top trades in Flames history or if the Flames win the cup this year which could happen to me that's the thing know, that puts this among the best I mean like I said I still think Don Lever and Bob McMillan for Lanny McDonald in the fourth that took the, I believe, gave the Flames one of the key pieces of their cup run. 
So if we can win a cup, I'll put this oh, in for, that list. Oh, for sure. And like the Kipper trade pushed us yep. into the Stanley Cup final. So, you know, like if the Flames can do that, like the Gilmore trade that I mentioned, that helped to push us into being a contender. So, like, it's one of those things where... It's looking great so far. Early returns is good, but, you know, how things shake out still remains to be seen. But, boy, is it looking like a home run. Yeah, so far it's a it's a great trade. And I think we also lucked out there. I mean, not something we probably knew when we traded, but we lucked out with the chemistry that Lindholm would have with our top two. I mean, even before that, we all thought that was Neil's spot. So good for him for solidifying himself there. Yeah, and the fact that him and Monaghan are basically the same age, because they were picked one right after the other, that it it helps, especially as this team progresses into like contender mode, that like you have your nucleus of the team all being the same age and all cost controlled for a number of years, like the Flames. Well, and that's a great point too on this trade is both these guys are making under five million, like. You know, that's a steal of a deal, especially for Lindholm, when you look that Tom Wilson is making more than him. Like, that alone could set this trade up to be one of the Flames' best. Yeah. Well, like, if things progress as they're kind of looking like they might, where, like, the Flames are one of the elite teams for the next handful of seasons, and possibly cup winners or cup finalists, this could actually go down as one of the better trades in NHL history. If oh, I agree, it, you know, and like a franchise altering, like the Lindholm trade type of thing, in talked of in the similar vein as like the Gilmore trade to Toronto, and we'll see. Uh, it, I'm just not ready to call that after 50 games, no, neither am I. But it's if you're having a trade that's looking like that, this is how it looks after 50 games, <laughs> you know. And we'll see how it turns out, but early returns, it's looking really damn good. It is. Yeah, I mean, as you said, we're often on the wrong end of trade, so it's kind of like the, you know, trading gods owed the Flames one. Yeah. Well, you you had to figure that one of them would go our way. Like, it, you know, like our if hit... you make fl- enough trades, you'll win one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's looking good so far. So let's talk this time next year and see if we think this is, like you said, could be the franchise-altering trade. Now, what are your th- thoughts on the Flames uh, possibly sweeping a bunch of the awards this year? Because, uh, like, Gaudreau's looking like the favorite for the Hart Trophy. Uh, Lindholm's looking like a favorite for the Selkie. Uh, Giordano with the Norris, uh, Peters obviously, and Treliving will, I'm pretty much, you can write that in right now, that they're going to win those two trophies. Uh, I think the Flames have to make it past round one for Peters to win. Uh, it's voted on beforehand, so... Yeah, I don't know. I think they and I think they do deserve to sweep. I mean, they're second in the league. If they can pick a bunch of hardware... Why not? You're, you know, you're deserving to do it at that point. Oh. I think if nothing else, um, Geo has to win Defenseman of the Year. If he doesn't, if he's not the the Norris winner, there's Something's definitely gone wrong. something wrong with the yeah with the voting. Yeah, like unless the other he gets ones hurt. I can see maybe not going our way because of you know Eastern voters or whatever you want to say. But you're 35 when you're playing this way. 35, give the man the Norris. Give it to him now. Yeah. Well, look at how long it took for Lidstrom to get a Norris trophy, and then he just basically won them a- after that. Like, I think he was 29 or 30 when he won his first one, and mind you, he was good the entire way. It's just that they always seem to give it to someone else, and I think that Giordano with his season, like, he's first amongst defensemen and goals, or, or points, I mean, and plus minus. Like, what more do you want? Yeah, I think there's no question there that he gets that one. I think True Living will get GM of the year. Um, I'm not 100% sure Peters gets it. I can see, honestly, the award uh, going to Babcock just because, you know, Toronto wins the awards. Possible, but yeah. I could see both of them being finalists one way or the other. Yeah, for sure. I think Peters definitely be in the three, but I just don't know if he'll win it. Yeah. 
I think Cooper Especially would be Especially considering the, now he's going to the All-Star game as a coach. That says something about him. Yeah. I think Trotz, uh, Cooper, uh, Babcock, and Peters are the top four. You think we give uh, Hitchcock the award for putting up with the Oilers? He deserves an award. <laughs> you know, like, jeez. <laughs> you know, like, you're a brave like, man. <laughs> you have to be bored in retirement to come out of retirement for that crap. Yeah. Well, we were talking earlier about potential, you know, uh, franchise-altering players. And one guy that was definitely franchise-altering, the famous number 12, Jerome McGinley. Big announcement this week that March 3rd against the Wild in the Saddledome, the Calgary Flames are finally going to put number 12 where it belongs and raise it to the rafters alongside Landon McDonald's number 9 and Mike Vernon's number 30. He'll be the third number retired. Um, by the Calgary Flames, the fir- first one really of this modern era since really that Stanley Cup team. Matt, is there anything we can say here besides excitement for Jerome? Well, it it's expected. You know, he's probably the best player ever to play at any point in the Flames history. And what do you say? You know, like he's a first ballot Hall of Famer great person what do you want you know uh, it's just like when joe sackick or steve eiserman retired for colorado or detroit you knew that those numbers were going up as soon as it was feasible jerome retired this year he gets his number retired it's one follows the other with a guy like that if you don't have your tickets already that game's already starting to sell a lot of people have jacked up the prices so see our friends at seatgiant.ca Use the code, promo site, code Fireside, and hopefully you can get a great deal on some tickets. There's still some not-too-bad uh, prices out there, but you want to be there on March 3rd. Oh, for sure. Matt, you were talking before the show with me, and you were saying, and I agree with you, how come Jerome's going up with, before Theo Fleury? Shouldn't number 14 be up there first? Well, frankly, Fleury should have been retired any time in the last, like, 12 years, so... When he came back for that training camp, I totally called it at the time. I said, you know, they're going to have him not make the team, last cut, and up goes 14. That's what I was expecting, and then it just never happened, and it never happened, and it still hasn't happened, and I, I it's and a mystery I to me. I thought when they, invented, you know, when they invented this Forever of Flame thing, I thought they kind of invented it just for Theo. Yeah. And also with that, I think that the Forever of Flame should kind of go away, and the two guys, Neuendijk and McKinnis, should just have their numbers retired. Like, you don't need another ceremony or anything like that. Just, you know, retire the numbers and get it over with. Yeah, I mean, if it was me, I'd just say that when we look up and we raise number 12, we have 2 and 25 up there as well in the style of the retired jerseys. Yeah, I agree. So the question now that I've been wondering is what – Jersey, do they raise the rafters? I mean, we have McDonald and uh, Vernon up there in the 80s white jersey because that's what they wore at home. Do you put Jerome up there in what is now the third jersey, sort of the 80s red style? Do you put him in the 04 style? What jersey would you raise to the rafters for Jerome? I'd go with the jersey that he had his most success in, which was the 04 style. Just because, hey, you went to the finals that year, and that was as far as he went. So, you know, that should in my opinion, be the one that he goes with. I'd hate to see the Alberta Flags jersey up there. Like, that just, like he used that for the longest part of his career, but it it's a lousy jersey. Like, you know, I'd rather them put, like, the retro jersey or, like, the Canadian Airlines jersey or something like that. Like, any, like, the pedestal jersey. I, like I, any of those, like just not the one with the flags on it. I agree with you. I want it to be the O four jersey. I think that's the most fitting. When I think of Jerome, when I close my eyes and you know think of highlights, that's the jersey he's wearing in my mind. But knowing this team and knowing how popular the retro thirds are, I think we're going to get the red retro third. What is it? now the retro third? What was the eighties style um, red jersey? Yeah, and I'd be fine with that. Like, it would create some verisimilitude between all the jerseys that are retired. And, you know, it would create the same theme, at least. But, yeah, it'd be kind of lame. I'd, I, I will be I'd a bit prefer the if they put them up in retro white. Yeah. That'd be a little weird. Like, 
I don't think he ever wore that. So yeah, that'd be a little bizarre. But what do you think the likelihood would be that they put Jerome up in retro red and they redo the other two to be retro red as well? That'd be a cool thing. Like it's a sea of red. You should have. They should have had the banners red in the first place. All the other banners are red. Yeah. Well, we'll find out on the third, but I'm I'm excited for Jerome. I was worried because at one point Ken King said we weren't going to retire any more numbers. We were always going to do this forever flame, and that didn't seem fitting enough for number 12. So I'm glad to hear that number 12 will get retired. Um, I think Jerome definitely deserves it. Now my question is, when does Kipper go up? Well, Kipper and Theo should go up. Beyond that, I don't really see anybody else. Um you see, like a guy like say Robin Regeer would have been perfect for the Forever Aflame, mm-hmm. where you're honoring the guy, but you know he wasn't quite good enough to retire his number, but he was good for a long time. I even thought That's Craig where, Connor would be great for that. Yeah, like sort of like your level of excellence for the Jays, where they have like a lot of their decent players from the past, but. You know, like not like the elite, elite guys. And I think the elite guys should get their jerseys retired, which is the guys that are retired currently or for honored with the Forever Flame, Aginla, Flurry, and Kipper only. And maybe eventually Giordano and Gaudreau, But I was about to say, I think realistically the next one up there might end up being number five. Yeah. And after that, number 13. Then number 19. And number 23. <laughs> there we go. We can we'll just retire all the numbers. Yes. Well, well, we can have guys uh, you know, like if we go in, and seventy two. Yeah. Well, if we go into dynasty mode over the next handful of years, then we'll have some reason to do so, and then you know we can start looking like Montreal. Yeah. No, we haven't been around nearly as long as them. They got what a hundred years or something on us. True. Um, eighty, but close yeah. enough. I'm rounding up. Yeah. Well, we've got one game coming up, and then next week we've got our bye week show. So we need you guys to help us out for next week. We need some content to talk about. So we want you guys to jump in, to give us some feedback, to chat with us, to leave us a message, maybe come on the show with us, whatever you want to do. Uh, you can go to our website, firesidechat.ca, right on the homepage. There's a button for the bye week. You can either send us a message and we'll read it on the air, or let us know you're available and we'll try to get you on the show to come talk with Matt and I next week. As well, you can leave a voicemail for us. Our phone number is 587 200 7176, and we'll play those voicemails on the show. Um, in celebration of Iggy's number being retired, why don't you call in with your favorite Jerome McGinley memory? We'd love to hear from everyone with those. So, Matt and I don't want to sit here and spend an hour talking about one game, so let us know what you guys want to talk about. Let us know what you think of the team this year. Let us know your favorite again, the memory. Maybe let us know who you think uh, should be in the rafters that's not. We want to hear your Flames content, so get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you guys. Yeah, and like you can even ask us about like uh, the trade deadline coming up or anything, really. Like If there's a certain player that you like on another team that you might think is a fit, you know, we can more than happy to talk about any of those kind of things. I have some exclusive content next week that I'll share with everyone when we get there as well. Cool. Um, Well, Matt, I guess that brings us nearly to the end. Why don't we do our prediction? This is the easiest prediction we've ever done. We got one game to predict. Calgary has a game this week against Carolina, probably the first time we've ever cared about a game against the Carolina Hurricanes because Dougie Hamilton's back in town. This is uh, Bill Peters' old team, Elias Lindholm's old team, and uh, Noah Hannafin's old team. So one game on the docket, what do you think? I think that the players are not going to have a fun vacation if they do not get two points just because Peters might be holding a bit of a grudge against his former employer. So I'm going to go with them coming out and thoroughly trouncing the Carolina Hurricanes. You can't beg skate him. He's not allowed to run any more practices, but you're right. He could sit here in Calgary and stew while everyone's on the beach. Yeah. Um, well, there's always the week after. and you know. It's true. <laughs> and we play the Hurricanes like the second game after as well. We play Washington and then Carolina again. So, you know, they he could be 
unpleasant on our first practice back. So, you know, they better go out and kick some if butt. If there's a game for Lindholm to get a hat trick, is there any better game than this? Yeah, I think so. And with Vegas and uh, San Jose losing today, if the Flames win tomorrow, they'll actually extend their lead in the all- before the All-Star break to seven points. Uh, over the uh, second place team so like I think that would be an important goal as well just to create that extra separation and start you know putting some real distance between us and the second place team in the conference and just motor right through so that way the Flames can try and lock up the conference which sounds so bizarre it's not it's nice isn't it like it's not something we talk about very often no, like us actually talking about a realistic feasibility that, hey, we could be the best team in the Western Conference this year. I, what? <laughs> I'm locking in my vote. I think Calgary beats Carolina. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm actually expecting it to be a high scoring game for the Flames, like another, like Arizona style, like six or seven to one type game. I think they're going to have some fun i think that carolina has weak goaltending and i'm i'm hoping that Lindholm knows how to solve their goaltending yeah well plus you have to look at like they just made that trade rask for nita rider and like they're struggling to generate offense like they did score seven on edmonton but you know come on that's not really that hard so it it's one of those things that the Flames should be able to get two points, and I think that they're going to. So you're you're yeah. going to as well? They should. All right. Let's hope. Let's hope. Well, it'll be interesting to see. Like, if they Matt, do get the win, they'll only be five points behind Tampa Bay for first overall. So, you know, we're coming for you, Tampa. I don't think we're going to make no, it. No, neither do I, but we have to threaten. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think, like you said, it's about really just separating us from the number two team and just focusing on being number one in yeah. the West. Well, like, the easier road that we have in the playoffs, the better. And, like, if we're playing the eighth team, like, it, it doesn't really matter. Minnesota, Dallas, Colorado, Vancouver, Anaheim, Edmonton, Arizona, they all suck. So, you know, we should be able to beat them in a seven-game series, any of them. So... You know, first is always best and <laughs> makes it a lot easier. Exactly. If nothing else, it secures your home ice advantage yeah, the whole way. Exactly. And that's very important. And uh, spe- speaking of which, if you're a season ticket holder, I guess that uh, playoff ticket playoff ticket renewals have gone out for season ticket holders. So if you're a season ticket holder, get your playoff tickets now. The Flames already send them out. Yeah, well, they've pretty much already clinched a playoff spot, so yeah. Don't really need to wait to see. <laughs> we don't know which games it'll be, but we know they'll play at least two games here at the Dome. Yep. And hopefully a lot more than that. I'm... <laughs> hopefully. Well, enjoy your one game this week. That's weird to say. Enjoy your one Flames game, and I guess uh, enjoy the All-Star game, and we'll talk to you next show. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Go Flames, go. Go team. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.